Away we go. Hello again, RJ Downard here in uh, the land of troubles in paradise, where we delight in looking at the source methods of anti-evolutionists and watching our time clickety-clack and typewriters and so forth go by. Uh, troubles in paradise, a methodology of creationism, tortukanwordpress.com. Lots of stuff there. Put that on your bookmarks. Look up, share all the material in there. That's what it's jolly well so for. Anyway, there's the opening little logo and away we go. Um, all by myself here today. Greetings, BJ and Brian. Uh, that um, uh, for those of you who have been living in a cave watching the show all these years, uh, the last few uh, months, uh, I'm going after Contested Bones, the uh, creationist book, Rupee and Sanford, bit by bit, chapter by chapter, source by source, uh, because I was requested to do that. And it's uh, an illustration of both how incredibly boring the process of source methods analysis is and how incredibly illuminating because you find out all stuff you didn't know about. Uh, the current chapter that they're going after, chapter number 11, Coexistence, Australopith and Man, uh, is trying to argue that uh, Australopithecines and these hominids and all the rest are all living simultaneously. Uh, and the, the kind of hide the ball thing, I think, is that Rupi is a young earth creationist like Sanford. So they really are conceptualizing this as being just a few thousand years old, but they kind of keep that under wraps. And I'll find out whether or not they... Uh, dive into some of that later on in their chapter on uh, geochronology. But the book has no index and it has no bibliography. And so the only thing you've got are the assorted uh, technical footnotes uh, that are at the bottom of the page. And um, you have to um, plow through all of that um, bit by bit by bit, which is precisely what I do in the book and put all sorts of defacing notes and all those little things on that kind of stuff. Anyway, um, <clears throat> He's bumping into Old Divi Gorge at the moment, which is um, a particular deposit where uh, you find the first Homo habilis fossils, and you've also got another layer higher up in the bed that's hundreds of thousands of years later, at least. It covers quite a long range uh, involved. Uh, and um, the fact is that um, they find just some of the cousins of the Australopiths in there. Uh, even they note that it's Australopithecus uh, boise, which is this um, uh, robust one that's got a much more rigid um, jaw structure and it's not regarded as a direct human ancestor or as close. It's a specialized Australopithecine that happened to be living in about the same area as the earliest uh, Homo habilis and then farther up the thing, Homo erectus. Uh, part of the cute little argument that they're trying to do here is this parsing no cousins rule. So just think of it this way. Clearly, if you're alive and your dad is alive and your grandfather is still alive, you can't be related to him. Coexistence. Or worse, that all your cousins can't be, uh, you can't be related to your cousins if you're alive at the same time. Family reunions must be very odd for creationists because they must be denying that all of their relatives are actually relatives. Well, what are you doing here, Aunt Harriet? You're, you're supposed to be dead because I'm alive now. That's exactly the same phenomenon that we're getting into in this coexistence thing. And if you look at the actual sequence of events, the Australopithecines date way back before the time frame of Olduvai Gorge. And so the idea that you can somehow disprove them, you don't find signs of human beings, homo sapiens, at the same time as Australopithecines. This is simply false. And I'm going to be loving to see them trying to pull this little trick off here. Uh, also, it relates to the earliest tool usage. There's, there's a progression of tool usage. Uh, so far, the sources that they've offered in here aren't open access. So I, I haven't been able to link to them uh, so that you can follow up on the thing. But I did put an art article in, which apparently he's not citing, um, from 2002, which is a very nice little review of uh, the inferences people are able to make in the paleoanthropology argument uh, of world about um, what we're eating and how we're going about doing it and what we're using these tools for and the progression of technologies and so forth and so on that's going on. And none of that uh, has changed in our current understanding of things um, um, 10, 15 years later now in the present. Um, we're getting a little side argument there, discussion on uh, um, some other bits here. Uh, Roger Penrose, oh God, God Roger Penrose, uh, Nightmares of Tangled Math, yeah. Uh, Brian uh, Stevens is bringing that out. Penrose, as I recall, is trying to argue that consciousness comes about because of quantum phenomena. And it's a really tendentious argument 
that I don't think really fits too much on this. He's trying, it's like trying to figure out why bigger balls do what they do by looking at electron microscopes and quantum theory. Uh, it, you know, you're at the wrong level uh, dealing with all of that. But it, it, it pops up there. You find some creationists who riff off of Penrose and that crowd um, too in trying to argue um, uh, for um, uh, invigling consciousness into the universe, but it's a strained argument to deal with. It's, it's uh, pay attention to the brain and neuroscience. Uh, that's where the business end of it is. And if you can't deal with that data field, then you're screwed. Uh, so anyway, um, the, um, the, this is one chapter in the book where it really makes a difference that they don't have a clearly conceived map of time where there is a sense of what's happening in what order and who's living where and all of the little details um, that, that all Rupi and Sanford are doing are cherry picking to scavenge the little blip quote factoids uh, to fit their argument that somehow or other Australopithecines and humans are all living simultaneous. And it also doesn't account for why um, the, um, the God that's involved in this, which wink, wink, nudge, nudge, is the God of Abraham in the Bible, um, didn't get things better. Didn't tell people about stuff better, about why there were bacteria or why there were organisms that were dangerous and what to do about things and the proper way of preparing pork, yum, yum. Uh, instead it said, no, you can't eat pigs. Uh, so, uh, but you also can't have tattoos and you can't eat shrimp, but it's okay to kill witches. That's okay. Um, that you get into a lot of, uh, uh, folder all on that. Um, I'm all by myself here, uh, Jackson, uh, Wheat, uh, and others, uh, uh, are probably not going to be showing up today unless they, he may be busy at school and that, uh, or uh, with his job there, he has to work his way through college as somebody who had to do that as well. I fully appreciate all of that. I'll try to fill in a little bit about what we've been doing on our collaborative book. Uh, the rocks were there and the newer areas, but one area that just came up, I didn't put a link up to it um, because it's just this little side issue. It came via an email, but it was an illustration of how astonishingly weird and stupid um, the uh, creation of subculture is and how gullible uh, there's a bunch of uh, hyper conservative websites and organizations. And one of this is this conservative newsroom that um, puts out emails and things and will link to basically hucksters that are trying to sell crap but framing it in a religious context so that they're presumably building on the gullibility. And um, this is one that I just couldn't resist, uh, which is uh, on a mysterious island a few hundred miles from the resting place of the ark. Have the children of Noah been located alive and well? Christian archeologists, scientists, and especially atheists will be stunned by this discovery, see it here now, link to a video. P.S. If you have any atheists in your family, I encourage you to forward them this video. I guarantee this will change their minds. And it turns out to be a really long series of huckster things for this Richard Gerhauser's um, herbal uh, remedy stuff, which he is passing off as the tabula vita the secret that Noah had, and he uh, talks about the flood being uh, uh, 4,300 years ago and all of that. So he sounds like he's a young earth creation. Oh, Jackson, is he in fact here? Uh, oh, BJ says he'd like to know why creationists are still using they found blood cells in dinosaur bones when they have been corrected big time on that one. Oh, that's an easy one because they're lying. Uh, and, uh, that's, uh, the, or they're ignorant boobs who rely on other people who got it wrong and they never checked. This is, this is, you, there are only two options because there hadn't really been blood cells and blood vessels and stuff found in any ancient organism like that. They're, they've got little tiny microscopic things that are like the remnants of a fragment of, of a blood vessel and things like that. That's about the best you can do. And it's all under t uh, uh, giant magnification and microscopes and always trapped inside of a vessel uh, uh, like bone and others that have been sealed off in such a way that it could be uh, uh, pre uh, uh, preserved. Um, that almost everybody in this, and it's always young earth creationists. I don't know of any example uh, outside the young earth creationist community that pays any attention to this. You don't get it in intelligent design literature. You, Ross, won't be paying any attention to it. Um, so it's a young earth creationist trope. And the, the sources will always show these gorgeous little pictures, but not give you the scale. Or if they do, they aren't paying attention to the little M for micron, the little uh, uh, M mu in there that indicate the scale of how small all this stuff is. Uh, the smaller group, particularly on social media that you and I and others have been pointing out the errors to, 
they just go on and on and on, repeat the same crap over and over and over again. And what it is, it's just deflecting off of the mind shell. So um, uh, that, that that's the uh, uh, the bit of it. Frustrated atheist says, "Damn hucksters!" By the way, who wants to buy my religious cure for all ailments? Yeah, it 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 suggests the degree of cravenness, probably, on the part these these people may in fact be completely um, calculated in aiming at that market. Um, because I see this kind of stuff popping up all the time where they realize that, you know, it, heck, if somebody is going to swallow the remnants of Noah's Ark in Turkey, they're going to be easy peasy for uh, buying my little nostrum. And and there wouldn't necessarily be anything illegal in it if it's just nat natural memory uh, or a, a, a natural, the, the tongue is all tangled up, uh, a nat yeah, natural remedies and uh, herbal type stuff. It's not necessarily going to hurt you. But, oh, oh, and supposedly, uh, Gerhauser is saying that this is why Noah and the bunch lived so long, because they, they, they were able to use this secret of Noah's remedy to, to make them live 900 years. And he's not necessarily promising that any of the people uh, that, that buy his crap is going to live that long. But there's this little tribe, this little people there that they found on this island off of Turkey. It's only a few hundred miles from the spot that nobody really can seriously think Noah's Ark landed at. That, that's the one, if you've ever seen that kind of boat-shaped rock promontory that some of the creation is to brought up with. I'm going to be including that, by the way, Jackson, as a little footnote in the new Ark uh, chapter and uh, the Flood chapter, because it's, it's just too phenomenally stupid to pass up. And it also allows me to bring in the issues of um, the various locations that have been selected for Noah's Ark and all of that. So uh, that one, including well. different countries. Yeah, yeah. Th there's it, um, most of them have to really be stuck in Turkey. Uh, the the mountain. There is one in Iran, though. Yeah, well, if, technically speaking, you have to remember that it's only the mountains of Ararat that are described in the actual text. Uh, Mount Ararat. Eh, with Agradagi, with this particular mountain that got associated with all of this much later, I think about the 12th century. This is way after the fact. And there, there were some apparently some little shrines and monasteries up there that have disintegrated. In fact, it's highly likely that some of the idiots who were finding pieces of Noah's Ark uh, wood were probably finding little fragments of some of these little shrines and stuff that have been put up in there. But it, it, the provenance is so bad on that stuff, even back in the 1970s, that uh, uh, most of your professional creationists shy away from it. John Morris and all the rest are very circumspect about wading into this area. But when you get down into the uh, the bottom feeder brigade, oh, they go where angels fear to tread. <laughs> and they just run right in, or if they have a buck to make. Uh, and that's another matter on it. Um, at the moment, I was, I've been uh, up uh, in the late night working through um, uh, Jackson's chapter six on additional evidence and relating to birds and, and feathered dinosaurs and all of that. I'm, I'm plugging in all the source material and sorting some stuff out and bringing up some of the little side controversies and delightful little side issues on things about... Uh, uh, that will also get its own chapter later, or it will be part of a chapter on transitional fossils later. And Minta by the way, I am I'm going to be alluding to Archaeoraptor uh, in the section that I'm adding on on that. So if, if, you have, uh, if you're going to be referring to it later, I'll already be springing that trap in chapter six, okay. uh, because the Microraptor directly relates to Archaeoraptor. And so I thought, yeah, I might as well put that in. So in a little section of a paragraph, I've got right. that plugged in. And uh, that allows me to drag in. Do you know that Chuck Colson, the old Watergate guy who got God, uh, um, he, he weighed in on the Archaeoraptor matter as one of the people that was riffing off of this. And they were all really? stamping their foot. So that's saying about all these crooked uh, evolutionists and their fake fossil. And uh, you don't hear too much of that except in the bottom feeder crew these days, because of course it's like 10 years old, uh, 20 years old, yeah, 1999. Uh, so uh, it's uh, it's kind of irrelevant. Plus Microraptor is so much more interesting <laughs> than Archaeoraptor ever was. <laughs> yeah, it, it's just, uh, yeah, it fulfilled the prediction that was made in the early 1900s that birds went through a quadrupedal flyer phase, which- yeah, Or at the least that one form did. Uh, it's probably right. not the case that Microraptor is on the direct bird line. Oh no, it's uh, a dromaeosaur. We don't, we don't, we don't have um, uh, a full blown area on that, but it is also interesting that when, again, I was putting things in kind of systematic order in there that the earliest ones that are found in the Jurassic uh, are really odd 
in the sense they're not conventionally bird-like. They've got proto-feather filaments and the like. They're precisely yeah. what you would expect, really yeah. early ones in there. And because they're the same period as Archaeopteryx, uh, you can't help but think that there's a busy period going on. I think if, if any modern arch uh, a paleontologist could go back and look at the period in question, they would be really intrigued to see what was going on? Uh, I think I mentioned in earlier shows that you don't find a hell of a lot of feather impressions back in the Jurassic. So whatever, however many feathered theropods there are, they're not so common yet that they're leaving fe stray feathers. Whereas you do find that in the Cretaceous, well, by which time you've got right. early birds going on. Uh, I think um, uh, probably the evolution of dromaeosaurs and avialans and well, manoraptorans, manoraptorans in general is probably tied to the radiation of flowers in the late Jurassic. There's, prob there's probably yeah. some. Yeah, some it, it, I think there. if they looked at all the different varieties of things uh, and the fact that uh, it, it's a good argument because birds have color vision uh, that uh, the dinosaurs probably did as well, the extent to which they're playing off of that. Uh, it's now looking way more likely that probably the most popular mode for feathers initially before they became co-adapted for flight was as sexual display. That yeah, they may have had a peripheral early role as thermal regulators, uh, and probably there was like fuzzy down, uh, maybe some early dinosaurs, although they've never been able to physically confirm that uh, with any, um, um, they don't have any lager state and eggs to be able to look at, uh, <laughs> to be so precise on it. But uh, but the, uh, the so many examples are showing up of ones with long filamentous things oh, yeah. and that that just scream sexual display uh, and the fact that birds yeah, are just sexual. relentless in all of their uh, little sexual routines and the little dances and stuff that they go through that that you can easily imagine a dinosaur doing a little whoop with the little feathers going up and whoop and then the oh, other yeah. one going oh um, baby yeah there was a <laughs> there was the whole group uh around the origin of birds with like the the feather, like the super long feather filaments, I think. Uh, yeah, it? yeah. Is one of them. But, um, yeah, oh, is, uh, um, I remember it was Epidextrus or um, Avimemus or one of those things that have some of these really long tail plumages. Yeah, just just like and, these um, super long feathers, just for like whatever reason, <laughs> you know, yeah. probably sexual display. So. Well, Brian asked the location of Noah's children. Yeah, it's a small island, supposedly. Uh, off the coast of Turkey where they live a long time. They apparently drink a lot of wine with mixed in with these herbal things that are Noah's secret to longevity that are available in my book. I'm not actually selling you the crap. I'm, I'm selling you a time. book about the crap <laughs> is what he's basically <laughs> saying. And so it it's astonishing. Mm. He, I look to see whether or not he's gotten any like lawsuits or anything against him, but he hasn't. But uh, who knows? Uh, give him time. Uh, these That's things uh, do tend to pop up. Yeah. Yeah, the um, the old of I matter and all of that. Uh, and by the way, I've even found a creationist. I put some references in uh, to the new book about that, uh, who was just riffing off of um, uh, Rupi and Sanford's book uh, like mad. And so you can see that all of these areas eventually metastasize and people in the blogospheres will be latching on to each one of these new little blips, which is why it's a good thing to keep track of all the crap. <laughs> Indeed. Yeah, yeah, we're. Um, um, I, I'm still uh, uh, structuring up my material for for the two chapters that I'm going to be after. I'm going to be biting the bullet on the cosmology stuff, and then uh, I'll be pulling all of that stuff in yeah. on flood geology. And of course, you're doing a geology chapter, which is kind of a fun learning experience what? for you. And then I'll be connecting it off. Yeah. And we, it, it, it's 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 a synergy of things. The 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 wonderful thing that's both uh, entertaining and annoying about creationists is unlike intelligent design, young earth creationists trample across everything. They, there's no limit to how much they're screwing up. Whereas intelligent true. design are on a very narrow track of screwing up. You know, you got your flagella and you've got just a few little little tropes, the Cambrian explosion. But boy, it's like like a vast landscape of stupid <laughs> when you're dealing with young earth creationism. So it's, it's a bigger field to touch off. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I've had they're always uh, obsessed, it seems, with whatever neo-Darwinism is. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I, I shocked you earlier when I said I'm a proud Darwinist. I'm a neo-Darwinist. I have the little neo-Darwinist well, action figure. <laughs> uh, I guess ne whatever neo-Darwinism neo has a bunch of different schools of thought as to what it represents. Yeah. It's gone through a bunch of different phases. So, I mean, tech 
I, some people would yeah. say we're it's still basically in the, the Darwinian synthesis from the 1930s where genetics got pushed into Darwinism because we have to remember historically Darwinism went into eclipse um, after Darwin. Uh, mm -hmm. In fact, to some extent, even wall Darwin, uh, that if you would have talked to most evolutionists, air quotes, uh, in 1900, especially American ones, you would not have found any Darwinist among them because they were talking about um, the, the mechanism of inheritance and the role of natural selection. And most of them were, were frankly, Lamarckian, neo-Lamarckian in nature, particularly in America. They would think that organisms strive to change and there's this orthogonal progression uh, in, in uh, and single species right. concepts that was that plagued human evolution studies for generations all the way down into the 1970s when right. it finally dawned on them that you could have more than one human species at the same time, duh. And this was a really awkward concept that I went into a lot of that in the human evolution chapter at TIP, where uh, I was going into the, the, the leaden issue of um, uh, the ones who were really pushing for a really early homo. That was another difficulty that was a thing that they were imagining way slower, oddly enough, evolution than what we envisage today, to where you would have to have the human ancestor back four or five or 10 million years and super duper slow gradualism, where we now know a great deal more about the developmental biology oh. and population dynamics and how multiple species and you can have hybridization zones and all that. And it would have just driven them nuts uh, back in the 70s. But we got the genetics on it now. Well, you know, I I always find it very strange to think of of directional evolution, but it takes millions of years for a specific mutation to come along to open up a whole new set of of potential pathways. It's like, why does this have to happen if it's if it's directed? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, in fact, I, I put some adjustments in. Of course, you've been following me as I've been putting the little links up to it. Uh, thanks to this one idiot hacking who was on Twitter and he was prodding me on the damn. Uh, somebody had brought up fish antifreeze proteins and they were at, uh, uh, and they were actually citing that brand new paper in PNAS on it. And hacking was just going ballistic over it and saying, no, 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 no. Why aren't these mutations happening randomly everywhere? And and why aren't they happening in, in warm water fish and all that? So that prodded me to look into the background of the notathenoids. And it turns out they actually originated in much warmer water than we now yeah. know. They, and and the mutations were occurring in them, and they probably were doing absolutely nothing for millions of years. And then the oceans cooled, and wow, they have the options to be able to keep spreading in that area because there's even gadids down in Antarctica uh, that are preserved yeah. that don't live in that cold environment. And uh, um, the, the, they'd even worked out the paleogeology of it. So thanks to Hacking's annoying little question, I researched more on the on the background paleozoology, paleogeography of uh, notathenoids. So thank you, Hacking. Uh, that they, they just don't realize how um, uh, annoying questions like that around somebody that plays source methods is actually a spur, and that you end up knowing more because you're researching the question at depth that they brought up. <laughs> oh yeah. That's how I feel about the chapter. Currently I don't often read zoology or uh, zoology, uh, geology, but when I do it's for creationism, uh, <laughs> having to look at a lot of, I've actually had to read one paper like three times uh, plus look up some animations on it on YouTube to figure out just what the heck Yeah, you, geology about. is, I'm daunted by geology too. Fortunately, I've been kind of inoculated more in it because there's a slew of geologists in this area who are um, really keen and some of the major paper writers uh, regarding the Missoula floods and the Columbia basalt. And so th there's an awful lot of them when you, there's they have a little coffee club that they get at at a local bar uh, every once in a while and they have discussions of a lot of their latest little uh, uh, operations. And if you want to, you you think a, a convention of lawyers is full of jargon, wait till you sit in a group of geologists because they have all of these extremely specific terminology that they will be using and, and they don't slow down for um, the hoi polloi. They don't give a rat's ass about making it really clear for people who aren't geologists. They're talking shop talk amongst themselves and you really get that sensation of it. Well, it's just a matter of looking up the terminology and plowing through it and figuring out what the stuff is and opening up and finding out what the secret handshakes are. It's a discipline like any other. And once you do, then you can start realizing uh, how wary creationists should be wading into this area. 
because the terminology is so precise that if they don't understand the detail, they can be led astray in their mythologies when they're actually talking about one topic rather than another. And even Andrew Snelling has pulled off little bullpucks oh, yeah. like that. Um, his whole little shtick about the rapid forming oil, which is in this chapter, by the by. Mm -hmm. um, oh, also, uh, per your suggestion, polystrate fossils will definitely go in next because he starts talking about logger shot and that's a good place to slip them in but yeah with, yeah uh, and all of that fossil formation. preservation stuff it's perfect spot for it right with the or exactly the the oil formation uh if you i looked at one of his papers in a video i did way back or we did we looked at one of his papers and he he says rapid oil formation has been done in the lab in two weeks here are two papers on it <laughs> and if you look at the papers it's talking about abiogenic oil which for anyone who doesn't know it's oil with that's not made from organisms Right. Yeah. And that is nothing like regular oil. <laughs> right. It's it, even in the papers, they say this is nothing at all like biogenic oil, which is made from organisms. So it's like they're, they're just, you know, trying yeah, to. So either either like Andrew no Snelling is blind as a bat and cannot read the content of his own cited paper or he's bloody well blowing smoke rings and lying. Yeah. And either one of those is not a good position to be in because there's no alternative. I find it unlikely that he. Uh, doesn't know the difference between biogenic and abiogenic. So, yeah. I think and he done the the they've done the same thing with coal uh, because you can theoretically produce some coal like gunk in a lab, but it's not like the stuff that you find in normal coal. And, and in fact, there's gradations of it depending on the stuff, plus the fact that so yeah. much of it was made from plants that are not common today. That's another bit. I'm sure you'll be bringing it up on the polystrates that these things are giant lycopods. Good old these things are monstrous. Dangerous. Yeah, and they're not like anything that exists today. They have a totally different dynamic going on there. Oh there's, yeah, uh, there's a whole slew of papers that I was exploring on Joggins Cliffs and the and the paleogeology of these things. That although there are some ash falls and things in there, the main thing is that it's it's a really active tidal surge thing, and uh, uh, it's a it's a fascinating paleoecology that they've worked out on all of this stuff. It, oh. it, it it's just neat um, material. <laughs> I've actually been reading a lot, a lot of botany papers recently on the evolution of plants during the Paleozoic. Uh, it's they pretty much worked it out step by step by step. Like what you had the first plants making land, the first land plants making landfall yeah. in the Ordovician. You had a diversification throughout the Silurian. You had the first large plants in the Devonian, and yet you know you're. Uh, rise of forests throughout the Carboniferous, you had your rainforest collapse, all this stuff, uh, gymnosperms yeah. and late Carboniferous. It's just step by step by step stuff. And uh, all magically while the flood was happening, of course. <laughs> yeah. And, well, and, and the, the fascinating thing about the Devonian is that it reaches the point where the, where the plants kind of outstay their welcome for a while, that they, that yeah. they actually upset the ecosystem. And they all, in, in for one thing, the kinds of erosion that normally occurs when there are no plants to hold soil in stopped because the plants were doing such a good job. So all of that upsets things right. and ends up in a long period actually destabilizing the system. And then eventually you have to have the, a kind of happy medium work out that the ones that survive into the new regime have balanced out. We The, the same thing has happened much more recently with uh, plants and fire because one of the reasons why you don't find grasses early is not because there's no angiosperms or the ancestors of them. But if you had that, fires can start too easily with the oxygen level as high as it is. So there's kind of a crossover bit that you eventually reach a stage now with the lower oxygen levels that we have now, it's only 21%. Um, it's able to tolerate more of these grasses, even though we still can have really catastrophic grass fires uh, that are popping up. And indeed, there's a whole bunch of forest forms that are adapted to fire where they get really screwed up. We discovered that one of the things that we've been doing wrong with forest management is trying to fire suppress because it means that, that everything gets overgrown with things that wouldn't be there and the poor plants that are dependent on the fire to get their seeds going can't do that because we're suppressing the fire all the time. It's really yeah. fascinating stuff. Um, yeah, uh, you're absolutely right. Uh, to your point, the, uh, the, the first, kind of the first large trees, the, the pro gymnosperms, well, I guess not the first large trees. First large was like you said, the like the lycopods, the like lapidodendron. But after them, the the pro gymnosperms were the ancestors of the gymnosperms and angiosperms. They 
basically they have this this huge lignified tissue because you're getting bigger you know because you have lignin now which helps stabilize your form you got to dig yeah. deeper into the soil for your roots and so that was uh causing that uh also caused like uh eutrophication because you had certain you had the bedrock under the soil was broken up uh which caused like uh anoxia downstream and yeah. was all the sorts of ancillary effects and another reason why there was so much plant material to play with to make coal seams is that the the lignin eating fungi uh, and their endosymbionts hadn't developed yet. Right. Although there are a bunch of different ways around this, but eventually you get a bunch of little critters that can eat that crap. And uh, once you get to that point, when a tree dies in the forest, it usually falls over. And instead of staying there indefinitely because nothing can devour it, it gets disintegrated. So you don't have that raw material available anymore. And it, right. all of that is just absolutely delightful. It was a uh, I only, huge um, yeah. the guy that uh, spurred me on, one of the people I was following, actually somebody was linking to him. They're doing research at Joggins Cliffs. And it turns out one of the areas that they're probably gonna be doing papers on in the next couple of years, I think his name is Higgins. Um, he, um, uh, they're fascinated with these examples in these, polystrate fossils that they don't call that. But some of these tree trunks, they'll find the remains of all sorts of little critters that have lived there. And so they're intrigued by why these are the way they are as to how long the stumps lived on their own and whether they were habitats for other organisms and all that kind of stuff. It, yeah. it's, it, uh, I'm sure there's going to be more science for the creationists to misrepresent that will well, be coming from this work. <laughs> there's like uh, lots of pictures in kind of popular books about the Paleozoic that have like Hylonomus, one of the early amniotes living in the tree trunks, you know, that's, that's a, a popular kind of picture or uh, uh, big spiders or things like that, you know? So, yeah. One of our biggest uncertainties is the missing data field because the one thing we can't tell typically from fossils is what sort of endosymbionts, what sort of bacterial activity was going on at the same time. Right. And we know in regards to our microbiome and all the rest that we are a habitat for mi microbes. And, and it's no expectation that these other organisms weren't the same way. We know, for example, that there is an enormous amount of symbiosis in the root systems in most plants and fungi right. and other kinds yeah. of things that they, they, they can do what they do because a partnership has developed over a very long period of time that we're now drawing off of Michael and trying Ryan to figure thing, out yeah. whether or not there were the same kinds of relationships or differing ones involving different kinds of organisms that are now extinct that's part of the uncertainty that we can't tell because we don't have a damn time machine. Yeah. The, uh, you have your, your bacteria, your rhizomes, but also your, your fungi, which I think have been implicated in the, the origin of land plants because they form uh, the mycorrhizal bonds with the roots, which help plants get nutrients from the soil and things yeah. like that. So. Which actually will be bringing up what I'll be getting to in the uh, the second section when we get to rake over some uh, James Cole and uh, Denise O'Leary. But first, uh, oh, let me boy. put up my uh, shameless plug and uh, uh, do, 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 um, and uh, thank all of my patrons and all that and tell everybody about the ways you can come help and finance uh, the old RJ uh, through his work. So let me get a uh, share screen here. The laborious process of R.J. Old Fart trying to find the damn green button. Okay, there we go. And then I got to go to application window now that I found out he was having trouble doing that. And I think that's what I want to do. Wait a minute, screen sharing. Wait a minute, maybe I'm not looking at the right thing. Um, wait a minute. And come along again. That's, uh, there we go. Yeah, it, apparently you select a specific window that you want to share now, and that wasn't in the older format. And so it wouldn't do anything if I didn't do that. So theoretically, you should be seeing my patrons. And uh, thank you very much, all the people who have helped through Patreon uh, to uh, support the project in any way, shape, or form. It took me a while to get it straightened out uh, with some prodding from uh, good old um, uh, Apologia uh, to say, look into this, look into this, and Strike for that matter. Uh, so that finally the, the, the donations that have been given over quite a long time finally 
opened up. And so I'm now actually able to make use of that. And that is making life um, rather less panicky than it was before. But anyway, our colleagues by name, Hendrel and Eric Rowley, and our researchers by name, Keith and Fino and Brad and Ralph and me, convert me and Pologia and Soar, and the assistant researchers, Direwolf and Durenko and James and Kyle and Nana and Staggles and Surus and Totus Real. And yes, Surus, I know I need to record more Phileas Fog and you need to do more editing on it. So we're, we're still in a long term on that. It's been a, a hectic, hectic few months. Uh, and the friends eat meal and Stephen and Marigale and insects are cool and Daniel and Bo and Alex and Paul and Zeshi and then some legacy patrons, people who helped earlier, who uh, financial circumstances change and they've had to stop. But I have, I have no um, uh, frustration with that. And you are still to be honored even now, uh, Jen and John and Andrew and Mona and Son and Everett. And then uh, down to the um, uh, next phase here where thank you all. And uh, behold and partake of my tip project at tortucan.wordpress.com. There's a lot of, I've referred to Dynamania and Planet of the Apes and all these chapters and things that I've done. Those are all open access PDFs. Download them, read them, study them, make use of them, share them. That's what it's there for. Uh, it represents uh, decades of work. Uh, that's how uh, Pelogia um, found out about me. He was discovering, oh, gee, I, there's, there's a lot of stuff in there. And then you can become a patron directly at patreon.com down or dip and or you can donate at uh, gofundme.com go and I will not discourage you from doing both, but either one will be very, very helpful. And you can do recurring things at GoFundMe just as easily as Patreon. Uh, uh, each one um, uh, brings the money in to help a dollar, five dollar a month from people on a regular basis. That recurring factor is really nice. One stop, one spot things are also certainly very useful, but the, to know things are recurring over a long period of time, the equivalent of a latte a month added on is really important. So there's my uh, um, uh, stop sharing on that and I can we'll close that down. Uh, I will call attention to um, my book. Uh, Evolution Slam Dunk, which is the uh, first uh, full-blown source methods analysis uh, attack on anti-evolutionism, which is going after how anti-evolutionists assemble their argument and how they ignore the data field. And it's on a subject, the reptile mammal transition, that literally no one else had done a proper survey of this before. And I'm extremely proud of it. And naturally, I want everybody in the world to have a copy of it. Uh, because I'll get the royalties and it'll also be really nice material. So evolution slam dunk and we're uh, uh, busy, whoops, uh, busy working on uh, the new uh, rocks. Uh, we're there book with Jackson. That's going to be out when we get that done. And then also in case you are of a mind for double feature, uh, there's the Paralogs of Phileas Fogg, my novel, my science fiction mystery retelling of Around the World in 80 Days. And I'm working on the sequel to that as well. Uh, all you need to be, just imagine in your mid 60s life crisis, um, trying to scrape together resources as a, as a social security retiree, doing two books simultaneously and multiple sections of each individual book simultaneously and Evolution Hour and the tip research as Jackson is also doing his schoolwork and all the rest. And no one can ever accuse either of us of not keeping busy. <laughs> That's certainly true. Yeah, it's because it's you know, school, work, YouTube. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, and of course I'm I'm jousting with the uh, creationist on the slide because I don't want any idiot to seem to be getting the better of the argument, uh, especially when they don't have the better of the argument. And uh, so uh, sometimes they'll be bringing up topics like hacking did, um, um, addressing that um, uh, fish antifreeze protein thing that was actually inadvertently an interesting point that prompted me to research more about it. So every one of these things are extremely delightful. And the one advantage, at least for the moment, is that I have enough to be able to actually not have to panic about getting ink. So uh, I'm able to print up uh, hard copy examples of things, and that speeds up the process enormously because to have to shut things over, uh, even now when I'm going through and I'm looking up some of the stuff, I'll check my pending file and discover there's particular papers on a particular point as well that I had back in the pending file. I had them in the bibliography, but I didn't have a hard copy at all. And I can go through now, shunt those over and actually print up uh, the relevant information of that and move that into the mix. So uh, all of that is really, really um, useful um, to uh, to work on. And then I got to pick dandelions today. We had a, a, a nice little crop of dandelions popping up. Every time, every day I go out there, there's more little yellow pops. I go, I thought I zapped you all yesterday and the day before that. Um, remember, weeds are nature's successful plants. 
And so uh, um, even though we don't like them for our bloody lawn, uh, I've got some natural invaders. There's a couple trees uh, that uh, have landed in there and, uh, and I'm going with them. And there's some um, assorted little uh, local uh, things that have little squiggly uh, flowers and stuff on them that some consider them an invasive thing, but I think they're way better looking than the damn grass ever was. And so I'm just saying, take over, take over, grow and grow. And uh, as they go into green mode, I mow around them and all that to make sure that they don't do it. And then in the backyard, there was a dead spot that was just killer. It was the land of nothing. You couldn't get any grass wouldn't grow there. It was just awful. It's right there next to the driveway and the sun was beating down all, all the time. It was just awful. So I found a drought tolerant shrub uh, that I planted some years ago and then drought tolerant succulents that require very little water and put them in there. And they're going great guns, yeah. So um, the, the the shrub is gradually expanding into the lawn and I'm going, grow my lovely, grow, take over, kill the grass, <laughs> get rid of it. I want the whole thing to be a giant shrub in that area. And um, uh, it's already like double or triple the size that it was originally. So uh, Lisa for Truth asks, why can't we just laugh the YECs out of existence? That's part of it. Um, the, uh, oh, oh, oh uh, Brian Stevens, new trope, lazy RJ and Jackson. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm already called lizard man by Cass on Twitter. She's lizard man. vague. Yeah. Because I was talking to reptile man? mammal transition and she decided she was going to disparage me by saying lizard man thinks he's from lizard a lizard. Man. And I've been, I've been embracing it. So I will sometimes sign my thing. Well, lizard man thinks. Uh, that I'm, I'm refusing to give up on it. Cass, there's the, for those of you who are on social media, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. If you don't and you want to spare your sanity, don't do this. But at any rate, you can spot these threads of wackaloons who are daisy chain serial enablers. So you've got Cass, uh, that's her, not her full name on that. I think it's Cassandra. She doesn't have a real picture, may or may not be a woman for that matter. Uh, you don't know for sure. But Cass is a vague hard to tell what she believes. And then she will like Jay Katz, who used to be Jay Andrew, who's a young earth creationist, but you, he usually doesn't discuss that part either. He's an origins or buster. And then there's hacking who I just previously mentioned, and that's his second iteration. He changed his name also to a different screen name. Uh, and then you've got PDSN uh, also known as uh, the real B I M he's positivism versus negativism. And he rants on and on about skeptics. Ooh, skeptics. Richard Feynman is a skeptic. Ooh, bad. And you can never pin down what exactly is that they've done. I mean, Feynman is one of the most brilliant physicists who's ever lived and a decent mensch. He was a marvelous, extraordinary character. I can't find anything to flaw him on on anything. Uh, and here are these idiots who are complaining about him. And uh, they're in this circle jerk, along with Deep, who's a Muslim apologist. And then there's a couple others that float around the, the periphery. But anyway, they'll like each other's tweets and, and crow and talk about all oh, the, the, the nasty uh, um, uh, atheists and all of that in this range, even though they have mutually conflicting viewpoints if they ever actually try to do that. Anyway, um, uh, in these weird exchanges that go on, uh, I will stand up for what the facts are. And uh, the, the object in all of these, and I, I, I like what I do, and I do this occasionally with Jackson and with other people, the envelods, where you have the idiots in their little network and there are a bunch of people watching them. The purpose of it in an envelod is to start talking about the actual issues in the line of the tweets where they're not involved, but everybody connected in that line is observing your conversation. So you are now talking about the evidence, you're linking to science material, you're explaining things, you're exploring stuff, and you are displaying by your method what the facts are and what your method is. And then typically speaking, those idiots will never venture into that field because they have nothing to offer. They don't know anything about it. And if they do, you can just swat them aside on all of that. So um, uh, the, um, the, the element of which laughter can be used or, or derision, if you've earned that by having the data field, that you have shown not that you're just starting out with insult or humor, but you can say, oh boy, Jcats, you've just brought Tour up again. Uh, uh, the James Tour, his video. Yeah, is like, yeah, yeah, and he's done a brand new one. In fact, I'm hoping that either uh, Psy Strikes Bunch can do it on one of their movie nights or I'm going to be investigating it in greater has, detail. Has Tour actually contributed anything to the biochemical literature? Not in not in the technical department. He's a, uh, he's a chemist. Uh, he's written a couple articles 
critical of abiogenesis work, but he's not a researcher himself. And he's basically just yeah. snarking at some of, at, at the very basic core. Of course, he's got points to bring up, but he's not brought them up. They've been ones that well, have been discussed in, was, the, in the biogenesis department because they want to figure out how it actually works. Well, I remember Tour as the guy who's, he's got that one article that always comes up where he asks three friends, I guess, if they know how macroevolution works and they all say they don't know. Of course, he doesn't name any names. So it's really yeah, he just, does the same trick in this video, apparently. And okay. the thing is, supposedly, according to the description, he has gone after Sutherland. Well, <laughs> Sutherland is one of the big researchers in this area and part of a very productive team. And so uh, I, I kind of wanted to let it dust settle a bit because I would not be surprised to find that there will be some of these people who when they because they may not actually know this thing it only just popped up as a as a, a, a directive it's from the discovery institute at some college or other uh, that was congenial to them and it, I, it runs about 55 minutes so it's fairly extensive but i'll want to be looking through to find out uh whether there are any source references there are none in the link so <laughs> it's basically tour just talking uh and oh. so it'll be a matter of trying to ferret out what papers he might be alluding well, to that's... and all the rest and so that's, Supposedly, he says somebody in the audience where it says, "If does anyone have any dispute uh, of my views?" And apparently, there's none. And so, aha! See, he's right. And uh, Hacking actually linked it to it. Uh, 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 Johnny on the spot, uh, and uh, oh, uh, David uh, Klinghoffer has now linked to it at uh, uh, Evolution News. So they're getting on the bandwagon. But it's still it's still early enough that I'd kind of like to see what other reactions go to it before I start doing a source analysis on it. So I got it on my linkage thing to get to. That's kind of like uh, somebody let uh, John Sanford give a talk on genetic entropy at an actual <laughs> uh, scientific place. And I was like, who the heck organized this? And Because yeah. that was what... Cause, Standing had that video and we looked at a little clip of it for the genetic entropy video where he makes the claim that, oh, everything, all the E. coli genes that were looked at during the the uh, Lensky experiment were either losses or down regulations, which is uh, clearly false. And we no. mentioned a bunch in our book. And we, I think I also mentioned or we mentioned one thanks to Nestle in the video. And so it's just it's it's wrong. It's like who gave him the platform yeah. Well, San well, I'll I'll give him this. Sanford has been published in actual science journals. Oh, yeah, it's but I mean, not been. It's been a long time ago, right, and the ones right. he's published in now are kind of fringe ones that he can squiggle a paper in on. But there's a bigger demographic going on, and I put a, a reference into it, as you know, in the new book, uh, is that he is being inveigled into the intelligent design movement. And he's already done uh, co-authorings things. Uh, I mean, what a cornucopia. Baumgartner right. and, and Stanford, both flat out young earth creationists, doing mm -hmm. stuff in that air quotes intelligent design venue on information and genetics and all the rest. Right. It, and, and so theoretically at that level, he and Ann Gager theoretically and uh, uh, Douglas Me? Axe can kumbaya because oh. they're basically the same theoretical mishmash but there's an axe to grind with sanford and we haven't yet seen what other axes there are to grind with with San with axe. well i mean <laughs> be he functionally disagrees with sanford on sanford's major argument uh that that's pointed out in uh, darwin's black box uh be he functionally and most i think uh intelligent designers except to a large extent, uh, common ancestry. Mm, but, well, no, I'll, I'll have to disagree with you on that. No, uh, Behe and Denton really are the only ones who that's do. That's it? What about... And, uh, yeah, oh, Meyer. yeah. Uh, Steve Meyer doesn't. I know he doesn't. Bill Dembski doesn't. So he's uh, a, the vast majority of them don't accept common descent at all. But Behe and Denton do it in that, uh, um, mis uh, that meaningless concession mode. Right. Oh, sure. I accept common descent. I'm never going to think about it. I'm never going to apply it to anything. I'm never going to say what is commonly descended from anything. Sure. I'm never going to examine any of that, literally. Sure. And that's been the case all the way along. It's a, it's basically a dodge to maneuver around because Behe doesn't even think that, that, that natural selection modalities can accommodate things up at the class level systematically. Well, that's not really common descent then. And, uh, but he doesn't think about it at any common detail level. 
Um, as you know, he tried to bring in chloroquine resistance as a way of right. diffusing the reptile yeah. mammal transition, and he never discussed any of that. So it, it, it's an evasion. And I know that in the cases where Behe has engaged in debates with young earth creationists, what they actually are is everybody presents their little PowerPoint and Behe never actually has any criticism of the young earth creationist. He just presents his PowerPoint. So it's basically the presentation of the mantras. And right. I've never seen any instance of any uh, intelligent designer ever substantively criticizing any young earth creationist position in public or print. They do it personally and privately behind the scenes, but vaguely. I've seen Steve Myers <laughs> talk about it generically, right. but he never writes a paper on it. He never does a bit of that. So nary has heard a discouraging word. So that, the, that, the that, the there's your list the then of the two, there. the two common dissent, the common dissenters in well, the intelligent design the movement. Two, it's a short the, list. The creationists <laughs> do go after intelligent designers though, as Purdom did. Oh in yeah, the answers book. So <laughs> it's because seems they accept long ages, and the, right. uh, and there are right. some uh, that that's why um, uh, the, knowing who the players are is relevant, because the young earth creationists are very finicky about their field, and so too are intelligent designers. By and large, intelligent designers stay incestuously in the camp, and you will not see them dragging in Dwayne Gish and Henry Morris and all the rest. Right. Uh, uh, likewise, young earth creationists may occasionally allude to be he as an authority figure because mm. he has an imprimatur, but they'll put in, oh, but he also accepts long ages. So it's kind of an arm's length on that. Uh, right. And then when you get down to smorgasbord level, though, those, <laughs> they just vacuum up all sorts of mutually oh, yeah. incompatible positions willy nilly. Oh, yeah. Uh, standing in, in uh, Matt. Is the other guy? I think. Uh, oh yeah. God! It's uh, uh, he. He could re he, if he had a battery pack. He could outdo Dyson for his ability to suck up stuff. I think that yeah, the, his whole talk with Aaron was just gold. It was an absolute gold <laughs> mine. Uh, yeah, that. Uh, oh, well, you know what's really funny, RJ? I'm not sure if you know this, but uh, uh, Nestlig found that uh, Standing posted a little meme where he had a fossil of. Psittacosaurus, or at least part of it, just like the upper half, and then next to it was a picture of a parrot, and it said, "Under the Psittacosaurus, like 125 million years ago," and then the parrot today, and it says, "No evolution." Uh, <laughs> whoa! Uh, it was that's like flabbergastingly stupid. Oh my! Yeah, gosh. well, that the SFT is good at that. Uh, that that we, we know by uh, what's kind of amusing is uh, he's been in several exchanges uh, that we've been doing uh, where um, standing has been observing other creationist talk or sometimes himself. Um, uh, you're probably aware of this as well, where um, uh, SFT has uh, been in debates or been observing debates uh, that uh, modern day hysteria has done and others. And he'll be all pleasant and all get out in the live chat. And he'll say, oh, RJ, uh, um, would you like to have another debate and all that? And I go, no, sure. He has. Set it up. He has all but of our happened. emails. Yeah, he has our emails. He knows how to get in touch with us. Nothing's yeah. stopping him. He is so unlike, unlike SFT, both of us have our actual pictures up. I mean, you know, I... I, I, I my emails out there, YouTube, Facebook, Twitter. Uh, I think I'm a pretty easy person to reach. The only thing you have to do is tell yeah. me like maybe two weeks in advance so I can like schedule off from work or whatever. But that's it. That's that's literally it. And me, I'm even more, uh, except for Evolution Hour and uh, a few other side like uh, Psy Strikes Movie Night, I'm really open-ended on things uh, as to uh, getting together on things. But I have been fussy in that uh, I have pointedly said to SFT, I'd love to have a debate on source methods and like a, a, an issue. Um, do creationists ever do sound source methods? So that one has not come across as a really hot topic. Uh, modern day uh, 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 hysteria prefers to have ones where the creationist is defending the positive point for their point rather than this one. And uh, I'd love to investigate source well, methods of these people. I'm willing to display my, I, I display my source methods constantly for people. Uh, I think that's the whole idea. point behind it. Um, yeah, you, there has to, the problem is, uh, I think that the discussions that 
uh, modern day debate has are are terrific. I think he does very good at moderating everything. Um, the problem is, if you want to do a debate, in my opinion, creation versus evolution is not a good topic for a debate uh, because these are two positive positions. And so if each person is throwing out their own positive sides, there's probably not going to be a whole lot of back and forth. So really, it should be for or against creationism, not creation on one side and evolution on the other. It's for yeah. or against. And even specifying what against. branch of it are they talking about? Right. Because SFT right. does an awful lot of hide the ball. He is a young earth creationist, Hovindista, and right. yet he is often not talking about he alludes to it but he doesn't deal with it michelle asked back there uh, uh so james down and i've been obsessed with fungi for a while now it seems to me that the fungi are a real-time picture of evolution any thoughts uh, uh jackson would you like to weigh in on that one first our little pals the fungi they're a real-time picture of evolution well uh i'm not entirely sure what you mean by that i mean they're more closely related to us than they are to plants they're members of the uh the opus the cons. Uh, I think they're in what are they in Holozoa? They're staggeringly diverse. Yeah, they have like five sect modes, um, uh, so they're more complicated than that. They're, they they have immense lichens order. are incredibly intricate endosymbiotic systems, um, and uh, the whole world runs off of them. Uh, as to um, there's no organism in principle that can evolve fast enough in real time to please a creationist. That, that you're going to want to have the fungus turning into a rutabaga or bongo chimp well, in your lab yeah. to satisfy them. But that's not how evolution works. And in if fact, want, one, then, one could argue that the major thrust of evolution is to not evolve. That if you've got a system that works, stick with it until you go extinct. And so what is the, and since most things end up extinct, duh, it's the rare, unusual combinations of things that don't seem to be playing a role at the time or doing something else. Uh, the, the, the drivers of macroevolution, I would contend, are spandrels. Uh, that, and that would make the ghost of Stephen Jay Gould happy. They're things that occur kind of accidentally as the side issue of something else. Um, one of the things that leads off ultimately to the fact that our skulls are laid out the way they are, we have our jaw bones up in our ear, uh, is to do with the fact that way back, oh. long before that occurred, you've got little teeny creature creatures eating bugs, and the bu bugs are causing the bug eating diet is well, selecting as a pressure to the expansion of the dentary bone. This is long before those bones ever get co-opted to something else. I'm not sure I'd say that's a spandrel. I'd say that would that'd be acceptation. But I think well, that's an other, that's a cousin. That's a cousin to that, you know, that, that, that uh, there's an overlap in terminology elements. Well, right, but uh, I that, think that, an ex exaptation is something that was doing something else. And the spandrel is something that was sort of accidentally derived from right. something that may be doing something else. So there's a lot of overlap. And, well, and right, like, Gould uh, would get into conniption fit arguments with people over the roles of what, what's an exaptation and what's all that. He, well, and he was an inveterate word coiner, too. Lots of neologisms, yeah. Um, well, yeah, he loved that. Uh, Many of which have never been used since because they're terrible and awfully overly specific. He put a whole list of some of the things that he's come up with over the years. And you go, boy, it's a good thing why we don't do use that one. Anything with too many syllables is a problem. Even Spandrel, after all, that was um, even Michael Dennett or Daniel Dennett uh, snarked uh, that technically it should be called a pendentive rather than a spandrel because the pendentive is the thing that actually describes that space, not the spandrel. And Gould was going, oh, really? Uh, but he did it with Lewontin. Lewontin, I think, was a was a tighter uh, terminology guy. Uh, there's a certain verbose uh, semicolons on uh, steroids quality to uh, a ghoul that that Lewontin didn't have. So uh, it, it was no coincidence that those two came up with that idea together. Right. Uh, well, I mean, uh, when I think of spandrel, I think of things like the chin, for instance. When I think of acceptation, I would think like you have the the feathers, mm -hmm. for instance, on dinosaurs which were accepted for flight yeah, yeah it's more direct I there i think I language is a spandrel um and uh and and from which everything else comes oh uh, before the hour shows up there i do want to make mention of the other two idiots that i were uh, linking up to um a good old uh james cole you you have encountered some james cole at yourself have you oh, not <laughs> christ he stalks my page Jesus. He does. He does me too. He pops up in some of the oddest little venues where, like, I'll be criticizing Donald Trump, the presidential White House feed, and up pops 
coal uh, out of nowhere. So I think he follows me. I, I just muted him. I, I got tired of seeing his, his just, I, I think he might be clinically insane. Uh, he uh, good doing a good impression of it. He, <laughs> he will, uh, uh, most creationists are fairly tight structured. When Sanford is citing a technical paper or Robert Carter, they are related to what they're talking about, at least. The Cole <laughs> routinely will lob a technical paper where you go, why did you think this was a problem? Why did you think this was helping our side? This one, this one was um, a, 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 an Ed Yong piece, and he was a wonderful science writer. He's uh, up in Carl Zimmer class. Uh, um, the viruses that eavesdrop on their hosts, and it's a brand new one from December 2018. I got the link in, in the things on it. And it's relating to this Papenfort paper, a Vibrio cholerae autoinducer receptor pair that controls biofilm formation. This is an intriguing little paper, delightful, and it's open access, and you can all go in and look at that. But it doesn't help Cole's argument that there's this kind knew. of designing architect thing. You're going, why are you citing this? <laughs> Oh no, they never do. Uh, when the story broke that uh, De Palma had found the remains of the asteroid that killed the dinosaurs, I posted. I think I posted the was it the PNAS paper, um, and because it was like a few days later, they the PNAS paper was finally released. Well, oh, you it. mean that one? Yeah, about the yeah the tidal wave thing yeah. that they found so up in I think I in or somewhere. It. Yeah, and uh, there's dispute about that too. There's there's pushback even on that. Uh. Sort of, uh, but uh, I posted the paper and uh, Cole, I guess, kind of looked at it, but he, he's like, they found platinum. Well, platinum was, uh, what do you say? Platinum is too heavy to have been made uh, naturally. And he links a paper about how like black holes create platinum or whatever, like how they're naturally formed. And I thought, what the heck? That's Cole. Yeah, he, he is he is a, a lunatic in terms of uh, citing material that's actually inadvertently really interesting work that he does not seem to understand is not helping his argument at all. When you say lunatic, I I I I don't think I don't think Standing is crazy. I think he's you know just a bad scholar. I think most yeah. of the creationists I meet on Twitter or YouTube are just bad scholars. I think Cole might actually be crazy. Uh, yeah. I don't, I don't mean that lightly. I, I really, I look at his, his, like the way he writes the syntax and all this. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think that that everything is going on upstairs. Yeah. He, he's another one that actually had a, a actual science credentials. He had published yeah. in regular material, but then started going into the woo mode and he's uh, if you look at somebody like an Alan Fiducia, there's there's nothing deranged about him. Right, uh, he, he has an argument that's 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 increasingly implausible right. and hard to defend, but it's still in the normal science discourse. Cole right. has moved out of that box. <laughs> um, even Pizzi <laughs> did, a, did a little piece on him a long time ago um, because he's been around for he's been around for a little while. Oh, yeah, uh, I hadn't little, heard of him until ceremony. relatively recently, but yeah, he's been around for a while. He's got the whole thing that uh, pheromones uh, control everything, whatever that means. Uh, not bum, natural. Bum, like. uh, it's like I, oh, the, I, now the other article from Ed Young is the one that Denise O'Leary riffed off of. They it did it on the same day to boot, so I, I had this suddenly <laughs> double whammy. I go, I can't resist this. Uh, completely different. What, why were they picking on Ed Young? Poor Ed Young. He does these wonderful <laughs> science works. And so this is a new discovery upends what we know about viruses. And it's showing about uh, how uh, um, um, there was a paper from Sicard, a multicellular way of life for a multipartite virus. And it was showing the dynamics of fascinating interconnections, how viruses inviggle into the system and even fragments of viruses can take on a life of their own because a lot of viruses aren't really alive. They're like Right. subroutines that can right. that can suddenly kick on and so this is yet more information where uh, um the uh, denise o'leary she may have written it herself on on um, uncommon descent uh because a lot of the stuff there is is anonymous and she in the old days would actually stick her name on it but you know so some of this stuff might be done by a minion and others might be actually by her but if it doesn't have her name on it i i don't attribute it to her but she definitely tweeted to it and she okay. tweeted, one way viruses get spread should never have evolved. Maybe in some fields we need some more stupid ideas that don't depend on what should have evolved. She was clearly misunderstanding the whole notion 
about um, uh, how uh, scientists are often surprised by how weird systems can operate down at the, the actual nitty gritty genetic level, but it's still natural. And, and, and if you're arguing that it isn't natural, that it's like the designer, the designer is making sure these viruses are plugged in there to do all these weird shit. Do you really want to go there? And Denise never goes there. She she draw, dangles these little tidbits without ever actually offering what their model is. That's the problem with Cole. That's the problem with Denise O'Leary. That's uh, the problem with all the animals that, that we bump into. Is, is they never really tell you what they think happened. They only tell you what they don't want to have happened, which is Darwinism. <laughs> right. Yeah, of course. Yeah, I, I really don't think Cole even gets that far. I'm not even sure what he thinks. Um, he, yeah. you, you were having a conversation with him the other day where you just asked him like 10 times, how old do you think the Earth is? And he just kept dodging and dodging and dodging. Dodging. And I, Always I, suspicious I, uh, uh, when when somebody won't tell what they think about something. I mean, if you could easily say, I'm not a young Earth creationist, I think it's uh, sure. four and a half billion, and that would be the end of it. Sure. But his reluctance to do that is immediately suspicious. If you believe what you believe, if anybody asks me how old I think the Earth is, am I going to be shy about giving them an answer? In fact, am I shy about giving answers on anything? <laughs> uh, not in my uh not in my understanding. <laughs> <laughs> because ideas worth having are one worth defending. You may disagree with it, but that's the whole point of being clear about what you think. And, and Cole has this weird gibberish boilerplate tweet that he puts out about syntax and stuff. It, it, it's a, it's a yeah. weird sentence that I have no idea what yes. he thinks that means. Yeah. <laughs> and, and yet he will be tossing out these technical papers as if this were were obviously a, an affirmation of this gibberish concept that he has and it isn't and 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 when i try to explore what exactly do you think is going on here whoop he's off yeah yeah that's that is <laughs> Denise uh, O'Leary never never says a damn thing she never responds at all but cole does but he doesn't say anything well some people uh they just write blog posts and the blog posts are immediately posted to Twitter. That's what Jerry coin does. So it, yeah, it happens. Yeah. So although coin does put more substance in on things, at least uh, right. that you find and he'll, and, and, and I, I actually, he uh, falls into several categories. One is just talking social issues. Uh, and uh, if you ever want to wave of somebody at the regressive left, just, Put Jerry Coyne out there. You know, he's like an attack dog. Uh, and, and then you've got stuff that are actually just comments on incoming science work, which he, he's, he's after all, a big league geneticist. So he gives yeah. an insight to a lot of these questions to where he's saying, yeah, but, and there's some issues in here and blah, blah, blah. blah. He, he's taken on and criticized, uh, criticized uh, Richard Prum's uh, new book. Uh, because he thinks he's overplayed the sexual selection argument. And there's legitimate issues to be brought up about that. Actually, then there's the... Yeah, yeah, and and uh, it, it, um, Coin gave it a very mixed review because he thinks he's overplayed the hand uh, about how dynamic a role he thinks sexual selection is uh, as a thing, and that he hasn't really documented it well enough. So uh, that's one that I'll want to investigate on. Hmm. But the fact that Coin is a is a heavy gun on the genetic end, uh, he 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 was one who who would take pot shots at um, uh, Stephen Jay Gould and punctuated equilibrium twenty years ago. <laughs> and uh, so that, that um, uh, it's kind of settled down since then. But at any rate, he's formidable enough as a science figure um, that you need to pay attention uh, when he's putting up caveats on things. Then the third right. category, of course, is his stuff on creationism. Uh, and he goes after both intelligent designers and uh, uh, young earth creationists now and then. And uh, it, it, it's fun stuff in there. So there's an awful lot from Coyne uh, that he's, he's entertaining, he's truculent. Uh, he's got his little hobby horses and uh, uh, he's articulate yeah. and, he, and he's connected up with an awful lot of things. And you often get he's an interesting clearinghouse because he will pay attention. He doesn't pay any attention to me. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm below his radar. He, uh, but um, others, uh, there's an awful lot of people that he connects up with there. So he's a, a useful one, even if he doesn't pay attention to me. <laughs> I don't know. Let's see if we can get him on. Mm. Oh, well, yeah, uh, boy, that'd be a miracle. Uh, but um, no, he uh, he grumps every once in a while when I allude to my work uh, as uh, I'm I'm touting my work in front of him. So he doesn't like that. He didn't uh, so like. He's taking he, a disliking to me. 
RJ, he can only have his books on the screen. Only his books. Only his books on the screen. Yeah, yeah. And and he's got a regular, but I'll, I'll, I'm sorry. I discussed more of the reptile mammal transition than he did in, in, have, in his books. I haven't read why evolution is true, actually. I, I really, I need to read that. I got I, it. And it's, I went through the, the reptile mammal trend. It's only like a couple paragraphs. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's a nice, adequate, generalized summary. And I even alluded to it that I thought it was superficial in the fact that when I looked for the references, because he put the kind of generic references in the bibliography at the end of the book, but he didn't allude to them in, in the course of the book. It, it's not yeah. aimed at that level. That's what but he had only one source for the reptile mammal transition, none of the technical papers. It was the old Hobson article from 1987. And I'm going, ooh, that's like 20 years old. Couldn't he do something <laughs> better than that? Because there was so much more recent work on the subject. And I thought that was superficial. Uh, well, and and uh, it, it's too big of a case to not deal with the more recent material. I think Dawkins gives the reptile mammal transition in the 700 page ancestors tale a whopping four pages. So yeah, yeah, uh, which is which is better than he did in in um, uh, the the uh, the, the other book that he had where he didn't mention it at all. Yeah, he didn't. Um, he, yeah, greatest show on earth. He uh, which did he write? I honestly can't remember which one because he wrote the second edition of Ancestors Tale. Yeah, I'd have to check my notes on, after, on uh, but, which editions were which. But, but at any rate, to my mind, it's it's just too spectacular a case to overlook. So there yes, it is. I agree. Anyway, uh, let's see if we got any uh, further last minute questions uh, or comments going on. I don't see any in the live chat uh, uh, on there. And um, the, the standing routine is um, I will debate. I will discuss things. Sure. Um, and and discuss any topic of legitimacy uh, in there uh, on a lot of areas. Uh, I'm not hard to find, and uh, but yet somehow or other, you know, Matt Huffman begged off ever doing the other half of the debate I had with him, and I doubt I'm ever going to have a debate with Kent Hovind ever again. Uh, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I put the link as usual to the Kent Hovind debate. There you get to see my source methods approach, right, full blown. And compare my debate with anybody, including Aaron Ra. Uh, even Aaron Ra can't derail, um, uh, can't on his end game of uh, bringing people to Jesus and all that. But I did. <laughs> you did indeed. That is true. Yeah, uh, yeah. I it it was a very good debate. Um, yeah, you know, actually, uh, modern day debates tonight. He's doing a talk uh, about Jordan Peterson. He's going to have Jake from Hugo and Jake on, which is going to be pretty neat. I think. Mm. I I, I, he's had an awful lot of debates on a lot of subjects and I have not been colossally impressed with <sighs> uh, a lot of the um, ones involved there was he would have several times defenders well, of evolution who don't seem to know anything about evolution well, I, I and do a terrible you know, job one of them was debating standing and he did well, a terrible job well I guarantee standing chose them I don't think mm. I don't think uh James chose those people. I'm pretty sure standing probably mm. bumped into So you see deck stacking to put people that don't know his well, jargon. He went up against us and you saw how that turned out. So Yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, because we're we're not impressed with created heterozygosity. <laughs> um I mean uh we pre-wrote my rebuttal because we knew the points he was gonna make. Yeah, I, in fact easy. I was pointing out. In, in both the times a standing has had debates with people on that channel, I've, I've pointed out in the live chat uh, that anybody that debates him has no excuse not to know his pattern. He's right. too routine. He yeah. has the same shtick over and over again. You could track down the technical papers and investigate this stuff. It's not like it's locked in a vault somewhere. He's, he's like an open book uh, in terms of his source material. And so anybody should know how to do that. They should have investigated all of this stuff and be willing Absolutely. to deal with it. Yeah. Um, yeah. So he, he this, makes this... Sorry, go ahead. Oh, that, yeah. So I, I think uh, you have the same routine. Neither neither one of us is averse to having a debate with anybody. Yeah. I, I, I routinely put on Twitter, I'll say, you know what I would love? I would love to talk to a creationist about the fossil record or baromenology if any creationists out there want to come on my channel, yeah. just give me a heads up and I'll, you know, maybe a week or two weeks in advance so I can, uh, you know, schedule and all that. Uh, I would love. I'd like to watch that. that. I, I mean, I, I have never 
I get the little keyboard warriors in my comments or on Twitter. But then as soon as you ask them to come on YouTube, uh, maybe we don't have to broadcast it necessarily. It could just be a private little hangout. Fine. Yeah. I'm okay it with that. It looks like there's somebody... Uh, it, I don't know whether James Ulysses is um, um, a pro or anti-evolution. It's sounding a little bit like somebody in the live chat there. Uh, somebody can answer. Um, is um, who? Do, 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 let me ask. Uh, it's uh, James Ulysses. Or Ulysses. I'm not sure how to pronounce it. Uh, oh, no. Let's. Um, um, boop, 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 boop. I'm perfectly fine Let's having see, people um, on my channel they want to talk about uh, the fossil record or baromenology. Creationists are welcome. <laughs> He's talking about, I guess, the, the um, uh, gyno tissue issue, and Brian was pointing out Mary Schweitzer and all the rest, and she's done, it's not just dinos. Uh, Mary Schweitzer has done work with James Horner and that over the years on turtles and a lot of others. There's an awful lot of oh, yeah. Mesozoic critter, critters yeah. where they have been specifically looking at preserved micro tissues inside of bones because they found these things could be preserved. And once they right. figured out like the role of iron, um, uh, okay, Lisa says that he's anti. Well, uh, James, uh, you're wrong uh, on that, and I would and and you should follow uh, Brian's advice. Read up on um, Mary Schweitzer's actual technical work. She's a Christian, it's and very she's very pissed yeah. off at how young Earth creationists misrepresent her work. Um, um, uh, if uh, he wants, I had him on, uh, I had her on his show a while back um, uh, on that very issue because we also it's, it's did a video about it, RJ. We yeah. did the video, um, the conspiracy theory guy, BS. I forget the name of the, the first video I did on him. He talked about the Schweitzer research, and we went very in-depth on talking about how the yeah. protein collagen is actually very stable. You've got the iron in addition to that. And in addition to that, you've got the the, the uh, hydroxyapatite, which is in the bones, which is further stabilizing it. So you've got three different stabilizations. Yeah, and that can, and that can actually crystallize. Uh, there was some technical work that I uncovered on that, that appetite stuff is, I think, they're little like hexagonal crystally things, and they can actually crystallize in living organisms. That, that, that you know, When they will look at the thing that's just recently dead, it will form these little preserve, preserve systems and that. So the idea that some of that should have survived a very long time in a sealed vessel like that is like, duh. Oh, yeah. I uh, mean, you, you would expect that. A tyrannosaur femur becomes a concrete tomb uh, once it goes yeah. through the, all the taphonomic processes. It's it, that's it. It's a time capsule, right? <laughs> you know? Oh, old, uh, old Scratch says he thinks the flagellum is irreducible. Yeah. So if you're um, uh, uh, James, if you are riffing off of Michael Behe's stuff, uh, maybe unriff a little and, and research the material. That. Nick Matsky has done a nice technical paper in Nature a few years back uh, with, oh, God, I can't remember the, the co-author, uh, Patsy or something like that. Uh, um, in uh, nature, uh, going into the precursor systems for the flagellum system. And um, there's ongoing work. We're pretty sure about the notion that the precursor to the flagellum was a secretion module. Uh, the, mm -hmm. the specific type three secretion systems used in modern organisms billions of years later turns out to have been glommed onto from these flagellum systems as a secondary attribute. But what the flagellum does in its core is squirt crap out to make the filament and mm. the uh, the flagellum stuff itself uh, auto assembles in high quantity so the interesting yeah. adaptation that's occurred and it's still not resolved is why a system developed and how a system developed that uses that little cap that allows it to secrete in low concentrations and that's what forms the flagellum now another factor that i had noticed years ago and that hasn't yet, I think, been explored uh, in terms of what this was doing. Did you know that a uh, flagellum triggers the interleukin response? And so yeah. that there is a thing that it, it's an invasion tool to invade organisms that involve that. And so there's a reason why this stuff is going on in there. But trying to piece together what was going on in the proto-flagellum, what, two billion, three billion years ago? It's a long way back. Uh, yeah. where there's no organisms now that are probably reflective of any of those training wheel systems because it's moved right. on. Uh, so it all has to be done by paleo retro engineering and that's hard work. And that means you're not going to get creationists to do it. Uh, um, what's his name down there in the uh, oh, uh, um, uh, University of Idaho? Uh, forgotten his name. He's, he's one of the few uh, anti-evolutionists who actually does flagellum research. He's not a giant oh, player in the field. 
uh, uh, Nimick, yeah, yeah, uh, Scott, Scott Minick. Uh, and he still does some papers on the subject, uh, and uh, he's still trying to push that frame. He pops up in the lecture circuit and that every once in a while. He doesn't write a great deal. Uh, he's not one of the the, the big poobah uh, ones, but he does videos and things every once in a while. And yeah. um, I've, I actually did two videos on the evolution of the flagellum. I did one on my channel and then one on Vice Rhino's channel. So check out either of those because yeah. it's all the same. One of the ones the that was still a mystery way back uh, were the motor proteins. Mm -hmm. And only just in the last like five years have they started to pin down what the homology systems are that are the precursors of the MOT A and MOT B proteins that are related okay. to something else. So it's a wonderful example of of these, uh, once you get a system where you've got this surging membrane system that's got stuff that's designed to either keep things in or squirt things out, and then you've got those little ATP rotor bits that can act as little engines going on in there. Uh, it's not at all implausible that there were a lot of variants on those systems that are in organisms that don't leave any descendants for us to look at because there's so much time frame going on. Yeah. And uh, but even the ones that we do at have a bunch of varieties involved. Just it, it's the same issue that pops up in like tarot cards or anything else, where when you're looking at a random sampling, and yet even there we got so many different varieties of flagellum systems that that's giving you a clue of what may be missing from from the frame as well. Right. I think the the different groups each develop their own uh, independently. I believe because they all they all use different systems. Like the, yeah. the archaea is different from the bacterial flagella, and which is also different from the eukaryotic flagellum, which uses a microbiome. Yeah, and there's like, I think, like five or six different secretion systems that pop up, uh, uh, only one of which, the type three, is of the form that we see right. as a precursor element that's still in the flagellum. That's how it assembles, it's a pumping system. Uh, and, and trying to ferret all that stuff and work all of that out, uh, since so few of the people involved, be he, he is not a flagellum researcher. Uh, he didn't even come up with the idea himself. He copied it from Michael Denton, including the picture in his book he got from Michael Denton. So, <laughs> and so there's an awful lot of secondary parasitism going on in this area. Minnick at least is working in the field, but even he is fairly circumspect about what he talks about. I guess he's kind of a creationist, but it's vague. He, he, he's like cold, not wanting to pin down on those sorts of things. But, you know, you really ought to think through all this stuff. Uh, I know when uh, Ken Miller had a, a debate with uh, Bill Dembski, and this was maybe back in the 1990s, I think in the American Museum of Natural History or somewhere, uh, they had a whole team going against team. And, and he tried to pin Dembski down. When did you think the design event was? And what did it involve? And whoop, doesn't want to think about it. So there's that map of time issue. Uh, and, and so you got the designer making the little flagellum so the bacteria can attack things better. Ooh, cute. It's like uh, I, I was reminded um, of uh, Ian Holmes' um, uh, uh, Napoleon in, uh, have you seen Time Bandits? No. You, you should see Time Bandits. You'll either love it or you hate it. I, I love it. Uh, and and uh, the, little, the little time traveling dwarfs that are running around and dragging the poor kid with them. And uh, it's got some delicious uh, uh, Monty Python-esque elements. But anyway, Ian Holm plays Napoleon, who is just uh, really pissed off at everybody that's taller than he is. You know, that Alexander the Great, a little teeny runt, only five foot two. And he says that, you know, when he's seeing the Punch and Judy shows, I like to see little things hitting other little things. <laughs> and and uh, that that's kind of the god that would make a flagellum system and parasitical <laughs> nematodes and all of that. You know, you've got theodicy issues here that are relevant if you're going to attribute it to design. Oh, yeah. And that's the problem with ALUs. Um, uh, my, my favorite go-to example of, uh, of genetic uh, of retrotransposons, you know, you, that, that um, uh, Jonathan Wells is trying to imply that they're designed. Does he mean all of them? All 1.4 million of them? All the <laughs> ones that don't seem to do anything and or the ones that do and cause diseases and or the ones that are actually doing something functional up in the brain and can cause diseases there too. I mean, are all of these designed and, and you never get an answer to that. Yeah. It's always just the vague. I, I think uh, these are they're, they're, the creationist arguments are sort of evolutionary anachronisms in a way because a lot of these are stemming from arguments 
that were taking place probably in their proto stages in like the 1800s, things like that. You know, how did we get this? You know, where did flowers mm. come from? Oh, it's an abominable mystery. Well, the problem is. Oh, yeah, that harder. quote. I know that. Yeah, well, it's a lot harder <laughs> to make those sorts of arguments now because the data has moved on so extraordinarily. Ooh, but the arguments yeah. themselves are still left over from the mid 1800s. We're still talking about. Yeah. Well, how does this thing evolve? And if it can't, then that proves that we're right. It's like, uh, no, that's not how that works at no, all. And and there and that's it. The, the plants are a very perfect example because, of course, we're way past um, the arguments, even as they were when I was growing up. This is old fart moment. Uh, <laughs> when you look at uh, what I was seeing in the literature in the 1980s, remember this is before homeobox genes were. Were discovered. This is before Evo Devo got off the ground. So they were looking at the forms of things and they were starting to identify Madbox and all these other little genes that are showing up uh, in the systems, but starting to piece them all together. Well, boy, has that speeded up <laughs> in the last 20 years. And so the data field is radically larger than the creationists think based upon their tropes of authority quotes from corner and the abominable mystery quote or stray little blips that they will be tracking from the science literature right. uh, in there. And, and they need to still account for the data. If you want to be an anti-evolutionist, go right ahead, but explain the data. And it means all the data. And if you can come up with a, with a detailed picture of what was designed and when and how many ALUs did Adam and Eve have in, in the Garden of Eden and, and all the other stuff that you want to come up with and why uh, we have um, um, certain pseudogenes in this context and not in others and how many created kinds there were and how many um, a, a speciation events there were before the flood and then how many afterwards in each lineage. Go ahead, do that. Write up your paper, put it in the uh, um, uh, Institute for Creation Research things and, and Answers Research Journal and goody gumdrops, let's see them. And that's the thing that's so fun about uh, us researching the answers in Genesis stuff because, uh, oh, the, the, the evolutionists won't publish in their journals, but they publish in the creationist journals and we get to read them. And mm -hmm. oh boy, do we get to read them. And some of them <laughs> actually, some of the creationists as I, uh, um, I just read just the other day, I was like uh, in the Whitmore chapter, he published a regular paper on fish taphonomy from the Green River Formation. So that it's not like they can't publish yeah, in long time. The well, uh, there, there are several of yep. them that still pop up and do very niche work. They're very right. restricted in detail. But right. then uh, even somebody like, oh gosh, he's the uh, one of the poobahs of the Discovery Institute's uh, Descent from Darwin list. His name suddenly escapes me. He's a preacher now, a probe ministries guy. I can't think of his name right off the bat. Anyway, he actually had a, a zoology degree back in the day, back in the 1970s, and he did some work. I tracked oh, it down. Off, it was it? on chipmunks, I think, or squirrels in, in Oklahoma, That's hybridization not area. Um, oh, hmm? It's not Ariel Roth, is it? Uh, no, 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 no. It's okay. uh, I, I just can't think of his name right off the bat. Okay. Uh, he's purely a preacher now. He hasn't done science work in years, and he doesn't even use his zoology material, and he doesn't even cite his own work. That's what's so revealing, because if uh, for what I know about uh, chipmunk hybridization, uh, that the last thing you want to deal with is the hybridization zones in mitochondrial interchanges that are going on in speciation processes. And that's exactly what this guy was bumping into back in the 1960s and 70s in his uh, graduate work. Uh, and that's how his name got attached to some science papers. Jonathan Wells is in kind of the same little boat that he he has right. a publication in the PNAS. It was a collaborative work where he's tailing on in the caboose uh, in there, but he doesn't use his oh, own the, work because his inertia. own work doesn't help. You're talking about that, that cell inertia paper, right? Something about mitosis or whatever. Um, no, this was a different one, actually. Oh, uh, I mean, one he's. In He's published some technical papers on those topics in some fringe journals. We but I think the PNAS one was on a completely different topic. Uh, it was it was in the course when he was getting his biology degree. Well, we mentioned one in chapter one or one or two in chapter one uh, where we were pointing out like, yes, creationists can publish in regular journals, but they typically don't. Here's an example of one. So I, I don't know if that. I don't know. We we mentioned yeah, a uh, Ulysses uh, James Ulysses is going on about uh, fine tuning. 
Um, that's another one that's a, a common trope, both in intelligent design and young earth creationism. Hey, James, but of course, I'll have you on. You want to come on my channel yeah. and talk about this stuff? I'll, I'll be happy to have yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. We he can you can have us two Jameses on, and we'll have a a, a, a wonderful little chit chat on uh, such. If you want to do that afterwards, fine tuning. Yeah. Fine tuning presupposes that there's anything that can be tuned that we don't have any way of knowing whether the stereo set can ever be different than what we see. And so you can play thought games. Physicists can go, well, what if the, the gravitational constant were different? Then you could figure out if everything else stays the same, what would be the effect of altering the, the uh, gravitational constant outside of certain parameters? And you can play thought games with that. And basically you can argue that if you tinker with too many of the constants based on what we know, things all screw up. But, you know, can you imagine what would happen if gravity turned off? Why, we'd all float away. Well, duh. But the point is, can that ever happen? Can any universe be made in which uh, force doesn't equal mass times acceleration? Can any universe be made in which E doesn't equal MC squared? Can any universe be made in which the gravitational constant isn't what it is, and the strong nuclear force isn't what it is, and the weak nuclear force isn't what it is, and the function of quantum theory and all of the other features that we've worked out is anything other than what it is? Can you make a universe in which mass doesn't bend space-time? Uh, we don't know. Maybe, maybe you can make a universe made out of spoggle blip, which is purple and perpendicular to October on Thursdays, that means nothing to us because we don't live in such a universe. Maybe you can do that. Maybe gods can make all sorts of weird universes, but we don't know that. And so the we only know the universe we do see, and the universe we do see has been around for 14 billion years almost, which is not described in any religious document. And then <laughs> way down the road, solar systems like ours have formed from the debris of supernovas, which no religious document ever described. And at some point or another, life appears, which is only bacteria, which no um, religious document ever described. <laughs> and billions of years later, we see endosymbiotic processes producing more complex cells, which no religious document ever described. And then we see then hundreds of millions of years of vertebrate development, including ancient forms like dinosaurs and transitional therapsids and all of these things, which no religious document ever described. And then finally, we start seeing very early hominids that start making tools and start figuring out how to do fire, which no religious document ever described. And then finally, we have human beings on the scene for hundreds of thousands of years, not having any discussions with any gods, giving them any concrete information about the universe. They have to figure it all out. And then only way down the road, after hundreds of thousands of years, after hundreds of millions of years of vertebrate development, after billions of years of biological development, after 10 billion years of spatial development, only at that point did certain people start writing down claptrap stories about how people became slaves because their ancestors saw their dad naked while drunk and why you weren't supposed to wear fabrics with mixed things in them and why you could turn a, a animal striped by putting it up against a fence that we're supposed to take that seriously. I can't. Well, <laughs> you know, well, it's a little bit different when you put it that way, RJ. But yeah. If you put it that way, but that's exactly how I do it. Um, uh, Richard Dawkins has made use of some of that same kind of argument that that's map of time thing. When you put it all out in the giant map of time, See, you get two versions of things in the creationist context. This is different if you're dealing with Hindus. Boy, we've gone way over the time, but I don't care. This is fun. Um, <laughs> the, the, the young earth creationists still are stuck in that compressed time frame. So there's the 4,000 BC creation of the universe, and then there's the 2300 or so flood, and then there's Jesus Christ -da, uh, at zero, and then... <laughs> the time waiting for the coming attraction of the second coming. This has gotten perpetually postponed. And that's their time frame. And there are people that, that, that everything has to fit into that narrow little box, which means that all the cultures that existed outside of that box have to be ignored, like they do with China or the Aborigines in Australia. And the time frame Ooh. has to be eliminated. So they have to move Egypt down past the flood. And they have to deal with all the critters that they don't. As you already know, where, where Todd Wood flushes all of the genetic information down the toilet when he's talking about the, the, the bat barrowman and he removes most of the fossils. And, you know, it, like this is impressing us. I don't think so. 
Um, and that's the young earth creationist problem. Now, the opposite is the old earth creationist intelligent design problem, which is the whole big gigantic field of data where there's time slice, 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 millions on 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 millions. And I haven't even got to the dinosaurs yet. That it's such a colossal frame that doesn't match anybody's Spurgle book. Uh, Spurgle is the term I've been starting to use now instead of God's, that when people talk about, well, don't you believe in God? You know, oh, you're a Spurgleist, are you? Okay, what is the nature of this Spurgle? And what is the nature, what book are you? Is this, you have a Spurgle book that you have? Uh, how do you deal with all the other Spurgles? And, and you, you can diffuse that loaded term God that religionists will use when they actually mean very different things. But the thing is, is that they still got to account for the data field. So they have to explain why there were dinosaurs and why there were therapsids and why there were endosymbionts back a long time ago and why did life spend so much time being bacteria. And, and you get these weird um, uh, providentialist approaches that you get with UROS in particular. This doesn't actually show up much in intelligent design apologetics. They're too obsessed with the Cambrian explosion and flagella uh, to really bother about much of anything else. But UROS kind of wants to have God the meddler so he's got to do stuff. He's got to have mass extinctions to get rid of some things so that he can allow mammals to get going. And he's got to have just things tweaked such way so that eventually we can have minerals in the right spot to use. And so it's very Panglossian. If you're familiar with Dr. Pangloss from Candide, that was the, the this is the best of all possible worlds, which by the way, was Voltaire satirizing Leibniz who believed that this was the best of all possible worlds, Leibniz being the guy that invented calculus along with, you know, so there's connections to all of these things. Learn your 18th century nitwits uh, and so that you can learn more about all of this. Uh, Leibniz was a brilliant man, but, but he was like a Euros type in thinking that there was this providential meddler. Well, we have a bigger time frame to fill than Leibniz ever did. When Leibniz was around, he would have no clue all of the stuff he needed to include on the field. Uh, they barely were working with microscopes at that stage. You know, they were just now working out how the solar system worked uh, and that. And so it's all kind of oh, fresh, busy. Animacules. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And yet we yeah. now don't have that thing. We've got the big picture. And there's so much going on, so much data that you need to account for. And I say, go ahead, account for it. Don't evade it. If you have a model, work out what you think happened, explain it in a clear way that you can explain it to somebody else. That's another wonderful point of source methods, that if you can't explain it to somebody, you don't understand it. And so if you, you should be able to defend everything that you are asked about. If you're saying, well, are you an evolutionist? Well, what evidence persuades you? You should be able to say that. If not, you're screwed. And uh, oh, um, bup, bup, bup. I'm, I'm seeing a side message here and I need to see what you're having to say. Uh, I want to cut so we can talk to you, Lissy. Yeah, sure. Or if you're just uh, gonna uh, read uh, all my messages out loud, I'll just say them out loud. <laughs> yeah, well, I I'm an open access guy. You should know that. I, I have no just, filter. I mean, I don't want to stop um, you. I just want to send you the message and just so you yeah, see. Yeah, I'm open to that too. Uh, uh, Lisa for Truth asks, uh, "What do you think of the idea of parallel universes?" That's an interesting subject. Um, that. I get a little bit pissed off over the ones that play fast and loose with multiverses. And I like to use two terms, in fact, because they're not quite the same thing. A multiverse might be an example of we have our little universe and somewhere over in the next county, so far away that we can't see it because it's beyond the, the, the visible universe that we can observe from the Big Bang, might be another universe that theoretically, if the universe lasts long enough, we'll bump into each other, but don't bet on it because it's like a trillion years from now. And there might be a, a, a finite number of such multiverses. There might be an infinite number of such multiverses. That's one form of multiverse. Then there's another one that involves instantaneous splitting of quantum phenomena to where all the possible states of every particle in the universe are bifurcating and generating a new universe so that there's an infinite number of universes being created as we see from somebody uh, farting or not farting in Albuquerque 
to some organism doing that in another galaxy somewhere. And every one of them is producing universes on universes on universes. If your brain goes tilt at that, it should, because it's a mind boggling concept and utterly disprovable, utterly undisprovable. You can't investigate it. You can't tell because we would, we only seem to be in the universe that we're in. And the suspicion is, is that's because that's the universe we're in. There's not multiple ones constantly fizzing off uh, like the bubbles coming up in a, in a Coca-Cola. Uh, now, there's another aspect to multiverses, and these involve brains. B-R-A-N-E-S. I will put that into this leaf chat so that you do not confuse it with brains as in the things up inside of our head that creationists don't use. Brains are actually short for membranes, and they are this notion that there are dimensional fields that move in hyperdimensional space. And when brains intersect, that the interaction of that fissions off what we call a universe. So big bang, whoop. And so these things might be generated by these multidimensional moving around brains all the time. And the scale we're talking about is vastly bigger than our universe. And the time frame involved is vastly bigger than our universe. Again, mind boggling time. No way at the moment to test such things, except some of these processes do seem to have potentially effects on the universes that are made by them. And for example, there's some odd little coolie spots in the cosmic background radiation that are consistent with being the result of brain interactions, if memory serves me, or one of these, these multiverse models. So some of these things are theoretically testable in ways that others aren't. And then there's other issues even be of that. Is your brain fried yet? Well, prepare to go into hyper mode. Yes. Because the, the these are all universes I've been talking about where the physical laws are the same, that they have gravity, they have the weak nuclear force and all that. They may be tweaked, but the question is, can you tweak them? And so the idea that there could be universes in which the fundamental forces are very different. And the idea that in a multiverse that you would have every possible combination of that. So there would be a universe with gravity just like it is now and another universe that's is a little bit different and another universe in which it's a little bit different, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and those all would have varying properties. But then are some of them actually made from completely different physics? And can we even imagine different physics like the Spurgle blob that's perpendicular, uh, that's purple and perpendicular to October on Thursdays? Uh, uh, universes in which saints fall uh, slower than sinners or are there saints at all? Uh, are they made of matter at all, as opposed to Vlupnubi that is effervescent and triangular? Uh, you know, that, that you're, you're, you, you can just play word games like uh, thing, and science fiction writers can play with these sorts of things. It's it's purely magical thinking. It's useless but fun, uh, and it doesn't really account for anything. All we can observe is our universe, and it definitely had a starting point, at least for the stuff we can see. Whether there was a before before that. We can't tell. Um, current models are undecided yet uh, on whether or not the universe is just going to expand forever and then run out of steam. Um, and in which case, if the universe continues to expand indefinitely, eventually it reaches the point where matter spreads out so much that the strong nuclear force can't hold atoms together. So all matter disintegrates. Isn't that wonderful? Of course, it's like trillions of years in the future. Don't worry about um, um, letting your insurance on your car lapse uh, because that's you know way earlier than the the heat death of the universe. Uh, or if there's enough matter, and that's where this dark matter comes into play, is it one that can slow down the expansion and then produce a big crunch? So under those circumstances, and that's less popular now as a model, but in principle, under those circumstances, the universe would come back together, kaboom, new big bang. So the idea of a cyclical universe that, that is constantly going between big bang, big crunch, big bang, big crunch, big bang, big crunch, over and over and over and over and over again, forever and ever and ever. And then the question is, could it have been doing that forever and ever and ever? And then your your anthropic -y people come in, your, your, your uncaused cause types and go, well, you got to have a start. You can't have an infinite regress. There's got to be a start except for the uncaused cause God, in which case there was no start. Uh, and now you're you're in this awkward problem. Uh, the ones, um, uh, see what you think about reaction to this, uh, Jackson. The, the, the Spurgle that makes the universe existed forever before making the universe. It's an eternal Spurgle and will be eternal after the universe. 
So how, when exactly in the process of eternity did it decide to change its mind and make stuff? It had been around forever, eternally. And now at this point in the eternal, it decides to make something new, at which point here we are. Uh, well, you're, was... you're still coming in on an eternal thing. Have I just seized up? My, my picture has stopped moving. No, I, I can see you're still moving on my end. Uh, oh, yeah, okay. I did okay. a... Having a, a good I am. I did a little. Talk I think that's an about um about the the five ways at LSU one time for like for the physics club, and or the physics club, the philosophy club, and it was pretty interesting. And so I talked, I got to talk a little bit about the five, the five ways, and the 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 uncaused cause, of course, comes up, and it's interesting because the 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 people the students who were there were philosophy, but there was an older guy. With his son who was there, and the guy was Catholic, I think a creationist. And someone, one of the, the philosophy students in the audience was like, Well, how how could you know how would the metaphysics of that work? How could something that is infinite cause something finite? How could you cause that? And he asked it was pretty interesting. I was like, hmm, that's a I, that's something I hadn't thought about. Yeah, at what point oh, yeah. did infinity stop being infinity? You know, it's like, hmm, that's kind of a weird question. <laughs> that's why I also like to bring up the Spurgel notion rather than God's. Because all you're positing is that the universe itself cannot be an uncaused cause. It requires a Spurgel or Spurgels. Does it require only one Spurgel? Uh, one Spurgel per universe or does it require a committee of Spurgels? Are the Spurgels themselves eternal or can they have a lineage themselves? When a Spurgel makes a universe or Spurgels in co a coordination, do the Spurgels sacrifice a quantity of themselves? Like you have to take so many uh, um, um, Spurgelosity per cubic meter to make a universe of, of, of hadrons. Uh, what exactly, is there a formula there? Is there a metaphysical dynamics, um, a, a spreadsheet Aren't balancing you act gotta have, of Spurgelosity? You gotta have faith. Yeah, and then, is it possible that Spurgles have to completely obliterate themselves to make a universe? So maybe there was a committee of Spurgles and five Spurgles have to collectively make a universe. And so they cease to exist. They sacrifice themselves to make the universe. Bye, Mort. We're never going to see you again. Thanks you for making, making positrons for us. And that's it. So you can see that, in fact, in this argument that you were getting into with Occam's razor and the uh, and Saint Anselm and uh, uh, the uh, Aristotelian uncaused caused argument, they're deck stacking their notion of Spurgle down to a very narrow form. And in particularly in the Christian context, it's the single God Spurgle, not all the potential possibilities. And we can't get outside to see the Spurgle manual. We can't communicate with any Spurgles and the Spurgles seem remarkably inept. Uh, at communicating with us. And in fact, the ones who claim to have chats with Spurgles apparently are the people least likely to actually be having chats with Spurgles. I, I, you know, I, I gotta be honest about this. <laughs> well, are you, you ready, RJ? Yeah. Okay. To do the chat with Ulyss, Ulyssy? Yeah, we're gonna be doing this independently, shut the show down and then have a private chat with him. How do you wanna work this? Yeah. That's fine. I already got it mostly okay. set up. Well, so I, will be, I will now say we've gone way over the time anyway. Thank you for listening to the uh, uh, RJ and Jackson bullshit about all sorts of fun stuff and mention some science along the way show. And we will see you next week. Hi-oh, stopping. <laughs> <laughs>